Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Trolling with Logic, 11th of November 2012. We are a bi-week live blog TV show uh, focused on issues of uh, skepticism, science, rationality, atheism and any other topics that relate to secular issues. Uh, like I say, we do take calls uh, just at the Skype contact Trolling with Logic and please bear in mind the video and audio are uploaded f to YouTube and iTunes for later viewing. So if you do call in, you're agreeing for us to use your likeness. So without further ado, now the legal stuff's out the way. We'll introduce my co-host for the evening. As always, Kitch2. Hey, guys. Uh, Martimer. Hi. And making his debut on Trolling World Logic, Live Life. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Great. Thanks and for having me on. Oh, it's great. And, well, we all know why you're here tonight. Uh, our special guest... Um, well, well known to all of us, probably most of you will know him from the documentary The God Who Wasn't There or from the old days of Reginald Finley's Infinite I show. He runs his own podcast, The Bible Geek. So without further ado, a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Robert M. Price to the show. Well, it's, uh, and I think it's better to do my uh, pleasure and honor to be on here. I really appreciate you having me. Oh, it's great. So, um, I'm just... Probably I'm going to start off with my first question. It's one I've always wanted to know about. It's I've heard a lot about the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible. What's the difference between the two, and is there a major difference between the two of them? Uh, there's, this is one of those things that's almost much ado about nothing, uh, because uh, Martin Luther decided, for various reasons, none of them all that compelling, to drop the books that the church had accepted really from the beginning that existed only in Greek and were read uh, in the so-called Septuagint, uh, the 70, to the number of translators supposedly involved. Uh, this is the, the Greek translation of what we call the Old Testament. And uh, since there were more Jews in the Mediterranean world than in uh, the Holy Land itself, the, this Bible was, was very popular. and. Um, Christians, of course, were all over the place pretty soon, and they used the, this particular Jewish Bible in Greek, and it had several books that uh, the uh, th that were not in the one used by the rabbis and scribes in Hebrew back in the Holy Land. And um, Martin Luther decided, when he was sort of taking the liberty to revamp everything, that it would be better to go with the current Jewish Hebrew Bible. And so uh, the books, including uh, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Jesus, Ben Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus, uh, or Sirach, uh, First and Second Maccabees, Tulpit, Judith, um, oh, and uh, the, the Epistle of Jeremiah, Baruch, and I suppose a couple of other ones, along with Greek added chapters of Daniel and Esther. Uh, these books, uh, he, he decided, weren't inspired and therefore not canonical, but he didn't really dislike them, and so they're edifying to read. There's nothing really wrong with them, and that's the way all Protestants viewed it. And uh, the, uh, the King James Bible even included these as a sort of an appendix up until sometime in the 1820s when they just stopped including it. The publishers, I guess, made the decision. And even today, there are a number of uh, translations of the Apocrypha, so-called, done by Protestants, including fundamentalists. Even the Living Bible, which is a fundamentalist book, has uh, a Catholic edition of the Apocrypha. And so uh, it's like there's nothing all that shocking or out of order in these books. Uh, the only thing I've ever heard that Protestants don't like is that in Second Maccabees, it mentions that after a battle, a number of valiant heroes fell, and that uh, some people offered prayers for their souls. And it says uh, that's a noble thought. Well, some took that as being a commandment to pray on behalf of the dead, and Protestants don't believe in that. So that's pretty picky. I don't, uh, you know, see what's so problematical there. And uh, Protestant historians used the books of Maccabees to reconstruct the intertestamental period. So nobody really is against them. It's just a question of whether you would base doctrine on them. Protestants don't. Catholics can, though I don't really know of any Catholic belief that depends on it. So it's, it's sort of a 
and it's been a teapot, really. Okay. Um, anyone else on the team with a quick question? We do have a caller waiting, so. Um, I, there's always uh, there's always one question that I that I had. I, I thought of it. It's just it's just failing to come to me. I had it. I actually had one before the show. So uh, I'm just trying to think. Uh, trying to think of it. Um, oh yeah, it was a. Uh, Many works of fiction have been inspired by true events. Has there any been any story in the Old Testament or, the, or anywhere in the Bible that has been at least inspired by some true event or something that may have been exaggerated? Uh, well, I, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I uh, tend to think that uh, virtually all of the narrative in the Bible is fiction, though that's certainly not unusual in, in ancient so-called history writing. But it does appear that uh, some of the least interesting material to me, uh, the stuff in uh, the book of the Books of Kings, as of about the time of the House of Omri, one of the dynasties of the northern kingdom Israel, when that kicks in, we do have some historical confirmation that, yes, that was a dynasty that ruled in uh, northern Israel, uh, not, not in Judah in the south. And uh, we have uh, references to it in um, oral inscriptions, records from uh, other neighboring countries. Not a whole lot, but enough to know that, well, yeah, there, there was a dynasty of Omri and uh, that uh, they were noticeable, even though uh, this, this country was a postage stamp, uh, was no great shakes. Uh, all the earlier stuff with David and Solomon and, and Elijah and Elisha seemed to be pretty clearly fiction. And uh, I would say that's about it. Uh, all the other stuff, myth, legend, uh, highest fiction with no discernible basis. What there might have been a historical Jesus uh, that's not implausible, but the state of the evidence makes me think the burden of proof is on anyone who would insist that there was. Yes, I have. It's okay if you can have a quest uh, ask a question, but uh, is that right? Yep, go ahead, MT. Uh, this is MT Without Brain, our very late co host. And to add to the international flavour, Robert, he's in Wales. Well, <laughs> great, I'm uh, mainly Welsh myself. Wee, sweet, I'm not low. <laughs> no. Uh, I was going to ask a question regarding uh, the nationality of the authors uh, who wrote the Bible. What were the main, uh, well, what were the range of, of cultures and nationalities who wrote them? Were they from different uh, countries or the same general country? Or I'm not sure. Well, there is a, a range, but it's a narrow one. It appears that uh, the whole Old Testament was written by Jews or Hebrews, if you will prefer that, if they were known outside the Holy Land. Um, but uh, even in, in this, it appears now that the, most of the Old Testament was written quite late in the Persian or Hellenistic period after the Babylonian exile and so forth. Uh, but it, it's certainly the work of Jews, some uh, Palestinian native Hebrew speakers, some more Hellenized Jews in, elsewhere in the diaspora, in the, the Jewish communities around the Mediterranean. Uh, however, there are a, a couple of items in the Old Testament that appear to come from Egyptian authors, just because the well-known Egyptian texts were lifted and put in there. Uh, the book of Proverbs, toward the end, has uh, a section in, in, in uh, a division called Sayings of the Wise. There are like seven sections of Proverbs, each with its own little title, and uh, this one section uh, seems to just have been copied from an Egyptian text the text called The Wisdom of Amenophis. Uh, and uh, there's uh, a couple of other parts of Proverbs that are one said to be by Lemuel, king of Massa. Well, that, that's an Arabian uh, city-state. Mm. Then in one of the Psalms, I think it's 19, they use part of Akhenaten's hymn to the sun. So that's uh, Egyptian. When you get to the New Testament, it's common for people to say that it was written all by Jews with the exception of the evangelist Luke, who was a Gentile. But I think probably um, the Jewish contribution of the New Testament is 
is quite small. I think Matthew was uh, certainly a, a Jew in, in either uh, Syria or Galilee, but his main source, um, the Gospel of Mark, uh, cannot have been written by anybody who was in, uh, in, in the Holy Land around the time of Jesus. It, it seems to be written for Gentiles by a Gentile, partly because of the way that Mark feels he has to explain Jewish customs. As readers won't know them, but then you see that he doesn't really know them either. So I, I think he's not. Mm. The other big source of Matthew and Luke is the so-called Q document, which sounds so much like cynic philosophy that uh, my guess is it was simply a collection of cynic sayings. And somebody cynic. put the name uh, Jesus. Cynic? Uh, it was an ancient school of philosophy, very popular. It gave uh -huh. rise to the Stoics, and I guess it began shortly after Socrates. And the, the uh, cynics who took it very seriously, it means dog, because uh, Diogenes, one of the founders, said that his uh, model for life was the wandering dog, because they rejected all social convention, government, family, business, working for a living, uh, family relations, anything. And, and so uh, Diogenes supposedly went around naked in public, and uh, they were really... Uh, strange bunch of hippies, and they were trying to say, look, no. do animals live the stupid way we live? Do they bother getting married and having governments and voting and having money? What a mess! That's a prisoner, and you made it. Uh, the, the rational thing to do is to live according to, to nature. Doesn't the uh, Zeus feed the animals? They never go hungry. Uh, we can just live off the land, too, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why don't you just give up all your possessions? It sounds very much like a lot of the stuff in Matthew and Luke. And uh, we know there was interchange between cynics uh, and, uh, and early Christians. Some people couldn't tell the difference. And I think we have cynic material right there. Could have been written by Jews, influenced by the movement, but it sounds so much like Gentile cynics whose writings survive. I think the authorship. Uh, the Gospel of John, uh, often said to be by uh, Jews, but the way it speaks of the Jews as an enemy, you, you really have to wonder if, if this was a, uh, a Jewish writer. The epistles attributed to Paul, now I take a, an extreme minority position on this, I think uh, none of the 13 letters with Paul's name on them go back to Paul, who probably was a historical figure, but it was very common to write up stuff and put the name Paul or Peter or James on it in those days. And uh, it seems to me that the letters attributed to Paul speak of the Jewish Torah, the law, in a way no Jew ever would. It's, a, it's an outsider's perspective. The book of Revelation might well have been written by a Jew, um, I doubt that Luke was, uh, or Acts, they seem to be uh, Gentile writings, pure and simple. So you've got, uh, let's say, possibly Greeks, Syrians, Jews, and Egyptians as known uh, groups who contributed this or that to the Bible. Okay, uh, Live Life, you can ask your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, a lot of people argue that uh, you could take, uh, I guess, back in the days uh, when the Torah was being written, that it could be possibly a polytheistic religion back then, or it started as a polytheistic religion and became a monotheistic religion. Uh, is there evidence of that? Oh, yeah. Uh, that is fascinating. I, I would recommend a book on that, a uh, couple of by Margaret Barker, one called The Older Testament and the other, The Great Angel, uh, subtitled The Study of Israel's Second God. And uh, she and others show that uh, as far back as we can trace it, Jews were simply polytheists. And in fact, archaeology indicates they didn't conquer the Canaanites. They simply were another group of Canaanites and shared essentially the same religion with Yahweh or Jehovah, pretty much the same characters, Baal, the storm god who rides in the cloud chariot and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. They had uh, Mrs. Yahweh, Asherah, who was, the Bible even says, was enthroned in the Jerusalem temple for three-fourths of the time it stood. 
uh, they had a dawn goddess named Shahar who is mentioned in the Psalms uh, and, and I think Ezekiel. If I take the wings of Shahar and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, uh, thou art with me, and thy hand shall find me, etc. The kings were supposed to be the sons of Shahar. Uh, they believed in the, the sunset god, Shalman, and uh, there are people named for that, indicating that uh, uh, their parents worshipped them like uh, David's sons, and so on, which means Shalman is by father. Of course, Solomon. Uh, they worshipped a bunch of gods uh, all over the hillsides in the so-called high places. And uh, originally, they seemed to have thought that there was a high god, king of gods, El Elyon, or God Most High, as it's translated, which certainly implies there are other gods beneath him. And in Deuteronomy 32, it even mentions that uh, back when the human race started, uh, El Elyon, the highest god, parceled out the peoples into nations so that each of his 70 sons it would have one to rule. So they thought the gods of the other nations were sons of the high god, and that Jehovah was simply one of these and had chosen Israel. But there, later, you see the myth that is very common in the monarchies of the ancient Near East that the God, or that Yahweh or Jehovah, became king by slaying the dragons, Leviathan and uh, the Hashtan and uh, Behemoth and so forth, and uh, created the world from their part. The Babylonians did the same thing, the Canaanites and all these, these ancient countries. And so then they said, okay, our God, the Jewish God, has been elevated because of his victory to be the new king of the gods, much as Baal defeated the monster and took the throne beside his father, El. And uh, so they're getting toward monotheism, that uh, they, they believe that uh, our God is the king of gods. But then in, I think it's Psalm 82, there is a myth about how uh, the the lesser gods were uh, corrupt and uh, guilty of misrule and that uh, Jehovah consigned them all to Sheol under the earth. And then uh, finally, in uh, the so-called second Isaiah, written during the Babylonian exile, someone pictures God as saying, I am Yahweh, there is no God beside me. And so pretty late in the day, you come up with monotheism, and that doesn't mean that everybody became one. It's just that that's when that was introduced, and it took uh, probably some centuries. Well, we're not even sure that in the, that in the New Testament period uh, most Jews were monotheists. Uh, so it's a fascinating thing, and we, we haven't ever noticed those passages before, like 100 years ago, the scholars did, because uh, everyone assumed that Moses was a monotheist, and he thought... Uh, the Jewish people, not, not a chance. In fact, Moses probably originated as a sun god. There's all sorts of clues to that. Elijah, uh, Isaac, uh, Enoch, Samson were all originally sun gods. The stories about them contain all kinds of clear clues to that. So, yeah, they were they were definitely polytheistic, and only gradually inched toward monotheism over several centuries. Uh, Robert, just there to... Uh, I've got to just put in here. Uh, are you on a cordless phone right now? By no. You know, all right. It's just the quality seems to keep coming and going on your call. I, I was just wondering that usually causes it's a cordless phone, so it's causing it right now. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's understandable. Yeah. Must be So I do. We've got a caller right now. Uh, anyone? Does anyone else have a question before we take a call? Nope. I just have one more quick one, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's, it's your yeah, you uh, Dr. Price, uh, how how important was uh, Constantine's role in adopting Christianity? And I think it was 1313, I believe it was. Uh, how important was that for the survival of Christianity? Well, uh, Christianity had uh, multiplied for, for traceable sociological reasons. Uh, in uh, a steady growth pattern, much like the, the Mormons and the Moonies have done in, in uh, modern times, very parallel. And uh, 
and so it was it was growing, and uh, it, it appears even that Constantine in the fourth century had been raised a Christian. Uh, there are these kind of bogus propaganda stories that he was converted to Christianity before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which made him the sole emperor. Uh, but uh, it seems to be legendary, and he seems to have been raised what we would call a Catholic or Orthodox Christian. But there were several other types of Christians, Jewish Christian, Ebionites, uh, Gnostic Christians who were esoteric and so on. Uh, there were Anacritite Christians who taught you had to run out sex to be saved. There were Melchizedek and Zoroastrian Christians, as we see from the Nag Hammadi text. I mean, it was a real zoo. And just as there are many, many different types of Buddhism today, well, he uh, was on the. He, he promoted the uh, the Catholic or Orthodox view and called the Council of Nicaea and to uh, to have his favorite bishop Athanasius uh, present his case and Arius, uh, another uh, theologian from Egypt. He presented the case that uh, Jesus Christ had not been fully divine, though he was the Savior. And I brought in bishops from all over the Roman Empire to debate this, and from what we know of it, it was a genuine philosophical, theological debate. But uh, Constantine let it be known who, whom he favored, and sure enough, uh, the vote went with Athanasius's view, which became orthodoxy, that Jesus was the divine word or logos incarnate, and that therefore if the Son, he, had, he was of the very same nature as the Father, not a, an archangel or a created being of any kind. And uh, so that became orthodoxy, and then there were several different councils, each about 75 years apart, that tried to fine-tune that. But uh, by calling this council and judging that its vote rendered orthodoxy, uh, that gave him the right, he thought, to, uh, to persecute the, the losers and the, the, the heretics, as he viewed them. And so there was violent persecution that pretty much stamped out everybody else. Marcionite Christianity and the Manichaeans survived outside the Roman Empire for a good while. But he, he was very important. He didn't have anything to do with choosing the books of the Bible, as one often hears. That debate was still going, and we don't hear of him uh, blundering into that. But the Bible contents we have had actually been settled a couple of hundreds of years before by Polycarp of Smyrna. And uh, it was just that his addition was then promoted by Athanasius in 367 in an encyclical letter saying this is the version of the New Testament we're going to use, nothing else. So Constantine's role was very important, and yet not as important as it's made in crackpot books like the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. I mean, they say that he invented the idea of the divinity of Christ. It's just a crock of nonsense. Okay, ready for a caller? Yep. And yep. it's Orwell in UK. Hello? Yes. Hi, can you hear my mic? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, okay. Okay, um, what, what, yeah, um, I um, have to just mute my own TV because it's coming through the, uh, yeah, so screen. it's missing. Okay. okay, that's fine then, that is done, it's done. So, I was just going to ask three of the questions, if that's okay. Yeah, that's no problem at all. Sure. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'd just like to ask Rob about the genealogy of Jesus, the problems with the governor of Syria in the time of Herod, and the and the uh, crucifixion with the meal, where where it where it contradicts on Mark and John. So I, I think I'll just start off with the with the Quirinius, where it says that in in uh, Matthew, 
that the genealogy well sorry 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 I'm, I'm getting mixed up in um in, in matthew and luke the the governors at the time conflict because it says that in herod um in the 4 bc that quirinius couldn't have been the um, governor because he was actually the governor in in 7 ad and the governor at the time would have been there would have been um, the varus I, I think i was just wondering what rob has to say about that because there's blatantly a contradiction between matthew and luke with the times yeah, so that, in fact, even in Luke, if you don't even go to Matthew, there's a huge problem because uh, you, because I believe he has uh, Herod involved, and it's a huge mix-up because Herod the Great was a kind of client king of Rome, but that meant that he was just uh, sort of an ally with the thumb on him. He, he didn't pay taxes to Rome. He was technically a king of an independent country. And uh, that remains so uh, after, uh, until, uh, well, uh, after he died, which was, uh, uh, geez, what was it? I think four, five or six BCE, as you say. And then Rome decided to actually make it a Roman province with its own procurator or governor, and they began to collect taxes. Well, Luke, or whoever in the book of Acts, mentions Judas of Galilee, who uh, fomented rebellion at the time of the census. Yes, so that's right, but there was a taxation census at that time under Quirinius, the Roman governor, and the rebellion was to say, hey, well, we've never paid taxes to Rome before. We owe tribute to God alone, and so there was a rebellion. So he has, uh, Luke has the census which took place in uh, something like uh, 6 CE or AD, uh, and yet uh, the birth under Herod the Great, and uh, that's a contradiction, but he, he imagines that uh, Quirinius governed the whole of Palestine, whereas in the time he specifies, uh, even then it wasn't the whole thing. And so it, it just uh, swarms with contradictions, and people have come up with uh, outlandish reconstructions <laughs> of what might really have happened, and it's, it's just all ad hoc hypotheses. It, it's obvious somebody's just trying to get out of a tight spot, uh, and oh boy, it just gets worse and worse. But uh, yeah, you are completely right. There's no way to reconcile that. In fact, you know, there were Jews and Jewish Christians who believed Jesus had lived about 80 to 100 years earlier. And uh, what on earth? Uh, I mean, how could you be <laughs> that uncertain about it? And that's one of the things that makes me think that, that uh, Jesus was originally a myth and that people trying to bring him down into history were just taking their best guess as to when he would have lived. Herodotus did the same thing with Hercules. You don't know, there must have been a historical Hercules. Now, when would he have lived? Well, this myth mentions this king, and that myth mentions that one, and he couldn't square him, so he finally gave up. Well, that's what defenders of the Bible's inerrancy ought to do, just give up. Yeah, that, yeah, there's blatantly a contradiction because Quir, Quirinius was the governor when the um, Tetrarchy of Judea was made the um, province, and that would have been when Herod was dead because Herod's son would have only got the um, land when he died. So, That's right. And in fact, Tertullian, in the, late in the second century, tells us who was the governor uh, at the, the time Luke has, and it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't Quirinius. He was it's later. Varus. But, yes, Quirinius Varus and Septimus. Yeah. Uh, oh boy! Se oh, I forget it now. So one of these two S names, uh, Severus something or other. Yeah. So uh, there's just um, no. Room. I'd love to ask another question. About... Sure. Stanty yeah, and Saturn. Yeah, there's like literally no, no, no room. Forgive me, I'm sorry, I talked over you. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah um, I would like to ask a question about the Passover meal itself, because in Mark, it states that before Jesus was caught, 
they um, they had the Passover meal that is in 1412 in Mark, but in John in 1914 it states that the sentencing from Pilate took place a day before the preparation of the Passover meal. So again, there's a big contradiction there of a day. Yes, uh, there has been an attempt that is not completely implausible to harmonize the two because we know there were sectarian groups like the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls who operated on a different religious calendar, much as uh, certain Eastern churches Christmas or Easter at least a week later than the Western churches today. Well, they had debates, and they were furious debates back then. And uh, so there were some Jews who observed uh, Passover uh, later, and it, it's been suggested, well, maybe Jesus was in his group were not that orthodox. It doesn't seem like they were, so maybe they followed a different calendar. And so the two, so, uh, yeah, it was pass, the Passover of the Jews, as it calls it calls it, uh, that that's the night the Last Supper happened, but that they, uh, but it wasn't a Passover meal, whereas in John, uh, that it was before the regular Jewish Passover, but it was theirs. This doesn't really work out. Now, it's, it's a mess, because in Mark and Matthew, the, uh, it's, the story does not actually describe it as a Passover meal. It's the earlier comment of the evangelist himself that says it was a Passover meal, though from what we read, it doesn't sound like one. It doesn't sound like a Passover Seder. And in Luke, he seems to see the problem. So he has Jesus actually say, I have long waited to, to eat this Passover with you. So Luke says, yes, definitely. Let's staple that in. This was definitely Passover. But as you say, John has, uh, has Jesus uh, condemned on the day of preparation. Well, was the meal he was eating at the Last Supper uh, a sectarian Passover on a different day? No, it won't work because uh, remember when uh, Jesus sends Judas out, what you do, do quickly, and he leaves. The others thought, oh, Judas must be buying something for the Passover. Well, then they hadn't had it yet. Uh, they're just eating dinner, and the Passover is, is going to be uh, later. So th that breaks down. It's another desperate attempt to iron out contradictions in the Gospels. Uh, it, John didn't even necessarily think this was historically true. He wants to have Jesus die on Passover as a new Passover lamb. That didn't occur to the others. So they prefer to have the Last Supper be a Passover so they can reinterpret it with reference to Jesus' death. So this isn't just like a stupid goof. There are reasons for it, but it sure isn't historically correct. Yeah, it does seem like they want to get it on the Passover side because yes. that's pretty much that. Well, both of them are doing that. One makes Jesus himself the Passover lamb. One has Jesus reinterpret Passover as about his his coming death. So they're both doing Passover symbolism, but they rewrite the stories in different ways. Yeah. So would you say that John, that John is clearly stating that the Passover was a day, well, sorry, that the crucifixion was a day previous to the, to the Passover? Because it does seem to me into that when he says that the meal has ended the um, the the meal what, what they had, which to me seems it couldn't have been the Passover because the Passover was for a week, and I don't it seems like the language in the text they're using wouldn't really mean to him saying that it's the proper Passover meal. Plus, he says that it's a day previous, like when they're actually there with Pilate to to the Jews. Yes, I think you're right. It's it's not a Passover. The Last Supper is not a Passover in John. If not for the context, you wouldn't know that it was supposed to be a Passover meal in, in Matthew and Mark. Uh, and in Luke, he, he's the only one that definitely says, yes, uh, Jesus says this is a Passover. So they wrote it differently with different agendas in mind. Yeah. I think uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think my next question is quite is quite a big slot because I don't really understand it myself, but in the ge- in the genealogies of Jesus you've got in Matthew and Luke totally different things when we get to David and Solomon because in Matthew it states that well sorry, it states a totally different line of family from David and Solomon to what Luke says. But the thing is, it, Luke is supposed to be the Mary's line. That's actually what I've heard because it said that Henry is the father of Mary. And because in those days, women wasn't thought as much, they wouldn't have inherited land. So your, so your son-in-law would make, well, well, sorry, your son-in-law would get all of the father of your wife's stuff, like, you would get all of the, all the land and money. So, in those days, I wouldn't actually mention the, the women in the, the lineage. But the thing is, I really struggle with seeing that Henry is the father of Mary, because it's supposed to be Joseph of Jesus. But in the Talmud, it starts to say that um, Mary has a father named the Emmy. If you understand that, like, there's two different contradictions in the G, in, like, in genealogy of Matthew and Luke, of the lineage of Jesus, because they're speaking about jo, uh, of Joseph and David is the line of David, well, sorry, Joseph is the line of David, and the Messiah is supposed to come out of the line of David. And the way they clear this um, contradiction up is by saying that Matthew is actually speaking of Mary and her father is heavy, which is also supposed to be talked about in the Talmud. Well, I've never read the Talmud, so I can say, but I've saw quotes from the Talmud, but I don't know if that's the same Mary that I'm speaking of. Yeah, that's very difficult uh, to know because we can tell from the data that survives that in the New Testament period in Palestine, over half the women were named either Mary or Salome. Uh, so there's the fact that one of them has that name, you, you just can't guess that, oh, this must be the same one. But uh, you're right, there's an intractable contradiction here, too. And the theory that Luke is giving us Mary's genealogy, for the reasons you, you mentioned, was floated, uh, gee, I think, a uh, oh, hundred years or so ago, by a couple of Roman Catholic apologists uh, Raymond Brown, a, Raymond, a Roman Catholic uh, New Testament scholar, did this great, massive book called The Birth of the Messiah, uh, the infancy stories of Matthew and Luke, and he admits you cannot uh, reconcile them. As for the idea that they might have put the husband's name on the wife's genealogy, first of all, that seems fatally silly if you're trying to keep records who is going to know you've done this there's no hint uh, that uh, that this uh, this isn't what it says namely Joseph's genealogy how could anyone be expected to keep this straight well I uh, happen to know the world's leading authority on ancient Judaism Rabbi Jacob Neusner and I asked him, is there anything to this? Was there such a custom? And he said that he had never heard of such a thing, and it sounded to him like just desperate thinking to get out of a contradiction. Uh, so I think also the, the early church, not long after Luke's Gospel was written, surely didn't take it this way, because in the Gospel of Mary, one of the New Testament apocryphal books, it says Mary's parents were uh, were Anna and Joachim, uh, so they, yeah. they don't have uh, nobody. Yeah, they weren't thinking of that. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. About it. Well, also, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I was just going to say, Orwell, is that the end of your questions? Um. Yeah. My, well. Well, I think I'd just like to ask, well, sorry, we'll stay um, one, one, say, one well, more thing. One more question, because we do have someone else wanting to call in. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, what I'd like to say is that the Gospels themselves can't be taken on board as, as um, truth, because the authors, 
didn't know the characters and the characters didn't actually know Jesus themselves, especially Matthew and Luke, because they met him through um, through the revelation. So I don't see how the canonical Gospels themselves can be taken on board as truth. Yeah, I agree with you. We don't even know who wrote them. Uh, the texts themselves don't have names. I mean, if you're reading the epistles attributed to Paul, whether he actually wrote them or not, we don't know, but they certainly do claim right there in the text to be written by him, whereas the Gospels do not say, like, I, Mark, am going to tell you the story. There's no name. It was only later when I think it was Polycarp of Smyrna, but some editor decided to tag them with names so you could tell the difference, which one you're referring to. And, uh, and it does seem to me that you just do not have the kind of accounts you would have if these people had known Jesus. There would be much more in the way of personal reflection. Yes, Jesus used to say to me, etc., etc., there is none of that. It does not sound like it was written by anyone who was on the scene. Yeah, it's just genealogy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, if they kept records, you wouldn't have these foul-ups. Uh, it, it just seems to me it's it, they might as well give up. Now, this is not to say the Gospels don't contain a lot of truth. It's just not historical truth, and there are different kinds. Yeah, there's like, um, there, there's like the, um, the, um, the um, archaeological truth and the real truth, which is a different thing, yeah. Like Jesus' parables, he's obviously depicted as making up stories. He's not lying to anyone. He's just saying, now get the point of this story. You see what I mean? It may be that the stories about Jesus are parables in the same way. They're not hoaxes or anything. They're, they're just uh, you know, teaching devices. Oh, okay, then. It's good to speak and get it through the air. Okay. Thanks very much for the call. Yeah. Okay, then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Yeah. And we do have a quick question from Belzar. Was Jesus born on the 24th or 25th of December, according to Christianity? Because, well, he's in Norway. He's, they celebrated on the 24th. Ah. Well, it was just a... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting an echo. I'm tripping over my own voice here. But uh, I think the first reference to Jesus being born on the 25th is in Tertullian, in late in the second century. And uh, there's no way really to calculate it, and it looks as if they just borrowed the birth date of Mithras, the, a previous sun god, which was uh, on the uh, winter solstice because he was the sun, and they believed that this was when he was reborn, when the days began to get longer. Everyone celebrated this feast, and uh, Christians were used to it in the Roman Empire, and it looks as if that uh, Christians decided, well, we're not going to celebrate the birthday of this false god. We want to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, but we might as well take the same day to do it. Uh, it'll stop our people from going to Mithras parties and so on. Uh, so no one knows for sure, but it looks like the idea that Jesus was born on the 25th is just borrowed from these other religions that were celebrating the solstice. Uh, and uh, the Bible certainly gives no hint as to when Jesus was born. I know some people think it does, but they have to really read the text in a very strange way. There's no straightforward information about it. Okay, um, anyone else on the panel have a quick question, or shall we go to next caller? Next caller. I'm good. Yeah, I have a question, but I can wait until after the caller. Okay, no problem. So, uh, it's one of our regular callers, G. Okay. Please answer. Hello? Yeah, I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, well, we're just yeah. waiting on her to pick up. She doesn't seem... I see, Hi. I see. Hello, Jay. Yeah. 
Yep, you're on the ER, so ask your Hello? question. Yeah, we can hear you. Ask can you you can ask your question now. Yeah, I, I can hear that uh, to tell uh, I can hear the ring of the phone. Um uh, Yes, no? Hello? Yes, we can Hello. hear you. We can hear you. Hello? Okay. Good evening everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, doctor, I have a quick question for you. There is a lot of uh, Bible uh, in uh, what's called Holy Quran. Uh, so, do you think there is uh, Christian uh, people who uh, uh, that strength of Quran and British pastors or give advice to people in uh, read Quran to, to take from Bible because there is already uh, fascinating this story so pick up uh, some of that story and put it in what's called Quran. Do you think that? Well, there are numerous Bible references in the Quran. Uh, there are stories told and retold about Noah, Moses, Abraham and Jesus. Jesus appears quite a lot, and in fact, the Quran has two slightly different nativity stories for Jesus, in which uh, the angel Gabriel, or Jibreel, as they would say, appears to Mary and says mm -hmm. that Allah will make your son a witness to the truth, etc., etc. And uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was miraculously conceived of the Virgin Mary. They even call him the Son of Mary. And uh, they, they just don't believe he was crucified. He was taken up to heaven before that could happen. And uh, will one day return to earth. And then he will die and rise when everyone else does. Well, this seems to come partly from the New Testament and partly from other so-called apocryphal gospels, some of which had Jesus cheat death. Uh, but the stories in the Old Testament especially sound like uh, they have come through uh, oral tradition. Uh, supposedly there was no Arabic translation of the Bible yet, and so there's a kind of second-hand knowledge of the Bible stories, and they all kind of sound just like the stories in the Quran about Mo about the Muhammad fending off critics and being persecuted and so forth. So it looks kind of like they modeled these stories of the prophets on stories of Muhammad. So there is some overlap in the uh, in between the Bible and the Quran, but it doesn't appear it's because someone was actually reading the Bible. Like uh, in the Gospels, Matthew had Mark in front of him and added a lot to it and changed some, but you can tell he, he used Mark. In the Quran, there's a lot of biblical material, but not actually from reading the text of the Bible. So there is overlap, but there are some pretty significant differences. And uh, they, the Quran writer or writers, whoever it was, uh, thought that Jews and Christians reading this would say, great, that's just what I believe. And yet, it also says in the Quran, <laughs> again and again, this is secret history. No one has ever heard this story about Moses or Jesus or whoever before. Uh, so they, they, there are, there's a belief that, yeah, this everyone would acknowledge this is true. And yet, they also say, uh, this isn't what everybody believes. We're, we're telling you the truth for the first time about these Bible characters. Uh, so, another question. There is a lot uh, in, in history about uh, Bible and, and Christianity. I mean history, not religion. But uh, they never find historic in, in historical evidence in things about uh, Muhammad or uh, or anything related to uh, to him personally. I mean in a historical way. There is no evidence. Uh, it, if you if you hear about uh, Islamic uh, untold uh, story that documentary from uh, BBC for 
talk about there is no real evidence if uh, Muhammad is uh, there or not, if, uh, if he is ever there or not. Uh, so uh, what, what is different in your opinion between uh, you find historical fact and evidence and if you don't doubt historical fact and evidence? Actually, uh, there is the same sort of question about whether Jesus existed, whether Moses existed, or the Book of Mormon narrative. All of them have these stories that they think are history, but archaeology just does not turn up the evidence, as you say. For instance, Mecca, according to Islamic tradition, was a, a burgeoning uh, center of of commerce and, and banking and so on because they were the center point of the Arabic pilgrimages, which survive, of course, uh, as the Hajj in Islam today. But we, we have, uh, we know where Mecca is, that you can dig, and uh, it turns out that there is just no evidence that it was ever more than just a minor settlement. There was no great commerce going on there. It's just like uh, in the Bible, there is no evidence of any palace of King David, no temple built by Solomon, and, and you would have to have evidence. I mean, these things leave traces, ruins, sediment, whatever, and, uh, and it's just not there, which pretty much demands that uh, these stories were fiction. It looks as if there was, like, there, there is no evidence that there was a settled city of Nazareth in the time Jesus supposedly lived there. Uh, it was inhabited before and after several times, but pointedly not when Jesus supposedly lived there. There's no evidence in America for any Nephites or Lamanites or their wars or their settlements. Uh, and there's no evidence at all archaeologically of an exodus. And surely there would be. We have infrared technology that can trace out hundreds of years old caravan routes through the, through the Arabian Peninsula. But there is no evidence of a massive population move from Egypt to Palestine, whether you pick the 13th or the 15th century date of the Exodus. There is no archaeological evidence that Joshua or anybody else conquered the Canaanites. And it just becomes clear what we're dealing with is uh, legend, fable, and fiction. A lot of it is, is great stuff. Now, when it comes to Muhammad, we do have some near contemporary uh, mentions of, of the first Muslims by uh, various Jewish and Christian authors who said, you know, these, these people... Uh, and condemn our practices. They say we should continue to uh, uh, sacrifice and to circumcise. And Brother So and So debated one of them. Well, oddly enough, uh, Muhammad is seldom mentioned in these early uh, statements, or when he is, he's a whole different figure. One source makes him a kind of promoter or prophet of of. Um, uh, the uh, the guy we know is one of the caliphs, uh, Umar, uh, called Umar al Farouk, Umar the Redeemer, and so he was apparently an, an Arabic Messiah, and uh, and Muhammad was a proclaimer of him. Like what happened? It looks like they've changed the story several times as Islam was evolving, just like with the other religions. There are many different conceptions of Jesus in the early documents. So you're right on the money. There is very little historical evidence about any of these religious founders or any of these major stories. Okay. Uh, 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 my last word is uh, Last Supper is a great painting, but it doesn't give any evidence to any mind. Uh, to tell us to exist or not in profit. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Cut Thanks off. for the call. Cut it off in mid sentence. Uh, we have another question from Belzar in Norway, and he's asking. Hello. Oh, no. yeah. yeah. Oh, you're talking to the caller. I'm sorry. Ah. Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me now? 
Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself while I was speaking. Uh, there's a question from Belzer in Norway, and he wants to ask about the story of the camel and the needle. And he said he's also heard in Jerusalem there's a gate that's supposed to be very narrow. So I'm supposing is that how that story came about, the camel and the needle one? Uh, this is a story that we first read uh, in the 13th century CE, AD, whatever, from the monk Theophylact in his commentary on Matthew, where he's sort of trying to get around the plain teaching of that text that, uh, like, how easy is it for a camel to squeeze through the, the eye of a needle? Well, it can't be done. And, and yet it would be easier for that to happen than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, uh, you know, if you have wealthy patrons to your church or your monastery, you don't want to start quoting that. And so what Theophylact did, or whoever he got it from, uh, was to re-explain it, saying, well, you know, there really was this tiny gate called the Needle's Eye in uh, Jerusalem, and camels would have to pass through it. And so to do so, they would have to get down on their knees and squeeze through. Well, that just means Jesus was saying, if they're to be saved and enter the kingdom of heaven, rich men must get down on their knees and repent. They don't necessarily have to give up their money or anything. And uh, so this became a real helpful dodge from the original notion that you have to divest yourself of riches if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, well, maybe you don't. Uh, and this, uh, so this is, as far as we know, complete fabrication. We know an awful lot about the way Jerusalem was set up in ancient times, and there is nothing about this needle's eye gate. And in fact, it, it's a common metaphor. Some of the rabbis speak about uh, the difficulty of an elephant getting through the hole in a needle. So it was a common uh, expression, and he's just saying, this will never happen. And uh, this, this thing about the needle's eye gate is an attempt to say, well, it's not that bad. Let, let's not get that radical. Okay, I think, Marty, you had a question. Yeah, um, I'm wondering about the whole flood story. Uh, the fact that, uh, well, well I, I don't know if it's a fact, but I've been, uh, I've been told from several places, I don't know how reliable they are, but that uh, this story occurs in pretty much every uh, major religion, uh, all, all kinds of civilizations all over the world. Um, what's your take on this? Well, that is true. There are a couple of hundred flood stories in which a few people survive. And, uh, and when you look at it on a, on a geology map, virtually every one of them is uh, from a, a civilization on a river or, or, or next to a, a, a sea. And the obvious inference is that uh, there was a devastating flood in those areas uh, with only a few surviving and so naturally they all told such a story and uh, since this was their world you couldn't travel all that far back then that we have many stories where the world was flooded and only a few survived in the Gilgamesh epic, it's Utnapishtim who is warned by the uh, the uh, Sumerian gods to build a, 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 an ark to survive and all that. In Greece, it was Deucalion who was warned, I think, by Apollo to build an ark or a chest, a box, uh, and survive. And he and his wife did, and they began to repopulate the world. In the Atrahasis epic, uh, there is a, a hero who's warned by the gods, same thing again and again. Well, it must have been all the, I mean, some of them may have been borrowed from each other, but when you're talking about all over the world, and it happens that they're all right near bodies of water, and the conclusion is almost inevitable that yes, they enshrine in a mythic way terrible, devastating floods long ago in their history. So it's not worldwide evidence that there really was a world-destroying flood, as in, in uh, Genesis. No, I I, uh, I heard some um, 
some version of uh, of this that um, there may have been uh, a single flood that it was all referring to, but in you know way back like uh, before the migration out of Africa or something like that. But I thought that sounded a bit ridiculous because that would have been before the invention of written language, way before that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so that just didn't seem. It, 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 no matter how you twist and turn it, it can't be uh, a reference to the same flood. It has to be different floods yeah. uh, in all these different local, quote, worlds, unquote. Yeah, that, I mean, this explanation is so much more natural yeah. than any exactly. uh, argument. Oh, yes, it was Noah's flood and the whole darn world was covered... <laughs> You're just asking for endless headaches. That cannot be made plausible. You can no. go on for an hour about the, the uh, absurdity. Where's the water? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, there's not enough on Earth. Of course, they couldn't have known that. Uh, they, it's not reckoning with there being kangaroos in Australia and penguins <laughs> in Antarctica. How did Noah get them? Were there a lot of little arcs that came to the Middle East and then they got aboard? You know, what sort of sanitation system did they have on the ark? And on and on it goes till a fairy tale being expected to be history becomes ludicrous. And uh, it's, it's, you, people who do in the Bible no favor when they try to drag it kicking and screaming into the realm of, of real history. Exactly. exactly. It, 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 the more they try to say it's all literally true, the sillier it gets. I, Can I you imagine that. if suddenly there were people that insisted that the Iliad and the Odyssey were literal fact and that Zeus and Apollo and all these gods really exist? That's really what you're dealing with here. Uh, uh, I, think, I think that sounds more plausible, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was uh, just uh, to follow up from that. So, do you think more that um, the uh, just going on about floods and that with the Genesis was it the Reed Sea that they were talking about? I think is that related to the flood story? I can't remember. Well, uh, in uh, the second Isaiah, so-called, one of the parts of the book of Isaiah, there is an interesting uh, reference to the Exodus in terms of the old myth of God destroying Leviathan. And uh, that, in turn, is, based, is uh, kind of related to the idea of the flood unleashing the primordial waters out of which the earth was made in Genesis chapter 1. But it's just a kind of a thematic similarity of the, uh, the, as for it being the Yam Suf, or the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea, which is a completely different body of water. The Hebrew text clearly says it's the Sea of Reeds, and it describes it as a body of water that could be dried up by stiff winds overnight. I mean, that's what the text actually says. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't say it was uh, something like on the, uh, the movie The Ten Commandments. Uh, it says uh, winds blew all night and dried it up, and when the Egyptians began to cross, they couldn't do it because their chariot wheels were mired in the mud. They're not thinking of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Red Sea, and it doesn't even call it the Red Sea. For some reason, the Greek translators of the Septuagint changed it to the Red Sea. And uh, so it's, it's simply a translation mistake. Okay, and Live Life, I think you had a question ready. Yeah, sure. Um, Dr. Price, I don't know if you're familiar that the, um, the International Coptic Studies that just took place in September where... Uh, I forget her name. I think it was a Professor Harvard um, of the Karen School. Karen King. Karen King, yeah. Uh, she basically said that uh, the four words basically said, Jesus said to them, my wife. Now, is there any, I, I could say, uh, in the New Testament canon, uh, not going with the canonical Gospels or the Gnostic Gospels, like, say, uh, the Gospels of uh, Mary Magdalene and, I believe, Philip, is there anything in those, since I've never read them, is there anything that basically says that Jesus uh, kissed Mary Magdalene? Is there any evidence that maybe he was married or he wasn't married? Well, 
Uh, the only thing that can be invoked in favor of that is that in the Gospel of Philip, it says the Savior loved Mary, and apparently it must be Mary Magdalene, and often used to kiss her on the blank, and there's a hole in the manuscript right there, but it almost has to be kissed her on the lips. And then the disciples grumble at this and say, why does he love why doesn't he love us as much as he loves her? And Jesus turns on him and said, what you ought to ask is, um, no, I'm sorry, they ask him, why, they say, why does he love her more than us? And uh, Jesus says, what you ought to ask is, why do I not love you as much as her? And uh, the, in the Gospel of Philip, uh, there's a number of references to begetting by way of kissing. Uh, the, the term kissing in Greek had come to be a euphemism for having sex by that time. But it's very clear in the Gospel of Philip that, that it's like Bride of Christ imagery in the book of Revelation. They don't mean physically. They mean that the teaching of Jesus begets uh, you know, a new birth in the soul. And uh, and yet some have, have seized on just the beginning of it. The, the Savior loved Mary and often used to kiss her on the lips, as saying, "Well, there you go. Uh, they were they were at least boyfriend and girlfriend." Uh, that's pretty thin evidence. Uh, it's certainly not impossible or unlikely. And, and Martin Luther thought they were married, and many people have guessed that. Like in Jesus Christ Superstar, there's an element of romance, but it never says any such thing in any of these texts. And uh, I'm one of those uh, that think that this gospel of Jesus' wife, as, as Karen King informally calls it, is a modern fake, because the whole text, the little of it you can read, it's just a scrap, seems to paraphrase material from the gospel of Thomas that we have, and the gospel of Philip. That's rather suspicious if a whole document just a little of it survives and it happens to parallel other passages we have it looks like somebody's trying to give it the ring of authenticity but they don't have any imagination to make up genuine sounding ancient text so they just crib it and uh, why is the only thing you can clearly read Jesus refers to as my wife I think it's just a hoax by somebody who is trying to really secure the notion that they were married. But as Karen King herself says, even if it is genuine, uh, that uh, it really doesn't tell us anything because many uh, ancient Christians at that time, let's say the second century, were debating on whether Jesus was married because they used him as an example of priestly celibacy. And some said, well, no, no, I don't think so, because he probably was married. On what basis, they never say. So I think it's really uh, much ado about nothing. I think this is really a, a fake anyway. Yeah, that's what I got out of it, too. Thank you. Well, would you say uh, Jesus was a, died a virgin? I'm sorry, say again? Uh, did you, would you say Jesus died a virgin? Well, if there was a historical Jesus, the way he's depicted as uh, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, like a Gandhi-type holy man, it, it would not be unlikely, though I, I think we can't really be sure even that there was a Jesus. And among the vast majority of scholars who say that there was, their, their historical reconstructions of Jesus are so wildly different because the evidence is so contradictory that uh, I, it's just one guess. It's like uh, buying a lottery ticket. You might have stumbled on the real Jesus, but who knows? And a question like this, nobody can ever answer unless Jesus kept a diary and they dig it up one day. Yeah, that's right. Just part of a random question, I thought I'd get out there. Okay, I think we've got a caller negation. Yes, how y'all doing? All right. Uh, doctor. Ask away. Uh, All right. Um, basically, one of the, the best um, arguments I've heard 
uh, from a historical standpoint, and I never get a straight answer from this from Christians, is if you look back at our at the archaeological hand and you know things that are not needed in an agricultural agricultural based um, society. But when we look at Adam and Eve and all of their children and anyone in the Bible, it's clear that that society that they're referring to is based um, in that time period. Um, so the discontinuity between what we find primitive, if you will, human beings versus what the Bible states as the first human beings, what are you, what are you getting as far as a response when that's brought up? Well, I just have been uh, working on a book uh, to be called Evolving Out of Eden, written with a, a friend of mine, and uh, we deal with this. There are a number of, well, of course, uh, you know, people that are just straight Bible critics uh, will say, well, of course, it's just uh, myth, uh, one of many similar ones in the ancient world, so there's no problem. They, they, the writers of it couldn't have known what conditions were really like, and they tend to telescope history from their point back so that they think Nimrod found that all the major Assyrian and Babylonian cities, one guy, or that uh, uh, Tubal Cain invented metallurgy with both bronze and iron. Hey, there was a bronze age and then an iron age. No one guy invented both exactly. of them. And so there's this huge problems, but there are a group of uh, conservative, Catholic, and evangelical Protestant uh, writers who know that uh, you can't take it straight, but they're trying to save as much of the origin story of the Bible as they can. So they try to say, well, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe Adam and Eve were king and queen of a, of a larger group of people, not literally the first uh, people. And uh, and so on, but none of it works. None of these, they're just fancifully rewriting it. C.S. Lewis did this too. And you might as well just admit that this only stories we have about it in the Bible, Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2 and 3, cannot have happened. Why rewrite something else and say, well, this is really what it meant, when it's obviously they're, they're just writing what they wish it said. And it just doesn't work. There's no way we could get to the human race from two people. You had to have a lot of people, some thousands, who had evolved to the same point and uh so there's it just doesn't work there's there's no way and the time factor doesn't work the genesis stories beyond that are a patchwork that uh presuppose different historical eras anyway look at chapter four with cain first we hear that this is the first man ever born of woman and then we we kills his uh his younger brother and then we hear he's afraid of showing himself in public because whoever kills me will find me. Who do you mean? Your mother? I mean, who else is there? Uh, and then we hear he builds a city. For whom? You know, is there a city is worth of people yet? Uh, it, it just doesn't fit at all if we hear he's to wander the whole earth, but then he builds a city to settle in. And, and where did he get his wife? You know, who was his, that his sister? Well, obviously, that part of the story assumed that he lived in a later time. It's just like Xena, warrior princess. They just figure, ah, she lived in the ancient world. And so from the episodes I've counted, Xena must have been about 14 centuries old if she was there at the Siege of Troy and met Galen, the physician, in the 2nd century A.D. Well, that's what it's like with Cain. It was just a whole bunch of stories said in different times, and that's probably true with several of the Bible characters. It's just not history. There's no way to make it history. Exactly. Thanks. That was, that was great. I appreciate it. Um, so, so I had one question. Um, I listened to your debate with William Lane Craig, and we've had a few other guests on who've debated him. What was your experience of debating William Lane Craig? Well, it was frustrating because he would uh, distort my views. It might be because he misunderstood them, but he's too smart for that. And I would spend a few minutes trying to set people straight, saying, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. And then he would go right back to, uh, to arguing as if I believed what I had just rejected. 
And uh, he struck me as just a kind of a slippery, dishonest uh, mm. debater in the worst sense, a sophist. Uh, and I pointed out right at the beginning that uh, Dr. Craig is not really interested in history. Uh, he just wants you to convert to fundamentalism. And can you imagine a scholar giving a presentation on the historical Jesus and then asking you at the end to pray to accept his religion? Uh, this isn't history. And, and sure enough, at the end, he did issue an evangelistic invitation. And he, uh, he just would, he would say, I hadn't answered his points. When he did, he would argue in a circle. Yeah. Well, we can all take this and that true from the Gospels. And I said, oh, yeah? And he said, if Joseph of Arimathea really buried Jesus in his own tomb, and the women went to the tomb and found it empty. I mean, come on, what else could have it been but a, a resurrection? I said, this is like saying that there must be an emerald city of Oz, because otherwise, where does the yellow brick road lead? And uh, he just would, uh, I think, stonewall, not answer the questions, and just keep hammering away with distortions. I, I want to say this is atypical. I've debated many apologists, uh, defenders of the faith, uh, Bob Siegel, Gary Habermas, uh, uh, Michael Green, a number of them, who uh, don't take that approach. I, I don't think, oh, there's a lot of uh, these people that uh, I've become friends with. I, I think they're terrific people. I disagree with them. But I've never thought they weren't uh, sincere about it, but Craig strikes me as a slippery character. I'm no mind reader. I shouldn't judge him, but that was the impression I got. Slimy fuckers you can get there sometimes. Huh? <laughs> mm. That's why I noticed with, uh, with his debate with Richard Dawkins and a fair collection of other people. He just ignore the main points you make and just go on to some random tangent he found on the internet almost. Yeah, he, so, yeah. Does. he yeah. does the questions at hand. He goes by a script oh. that he has. That's what I noticed with Sean. He kept insisting that a worldview was something of his, uh, you know, saying something specific when it's, it's just made, when an say it's just due to your own experience. I said that to him, but he kept insisting, you know, a worldview is something, you know, of what you believe in, and that's it. When it's completely not. Yeah, if you say, uh, well, every worldview is equally arbitrary, which is a kind of postmodernism that I don't like, yeah. well, you're, you're pulling the rug out from under your own feet. Mm. You're saying, I have no real reason to believe, but neither do you, so let's just believe what we want. Well, why are you even debating it in that case? Mm. Uh, oh, brother, it just sort of sounds good to the unwary. Oh, boy. Oh, another sure. thing he and others insistently repeat is, well, you guys just don't believe the Bible because you have a, uh, an already established presupposition yeah. against miracles. And I tell them, look, I do not. I have never, I don't live through history. I don't see what's going on. I have no idea what's going on in the world. Uh, I don't know if this is a God or not a God. How can I know such a thing? I do not operate with that principle. It, it, <laughs> the historical criticism doesn't demand such a view. It's all based on the principle of historical analogy, which I wanted to explain. But then they keep saying, oh, you just reject miracles on principle. I, you know, what do I have to do? Take a lie detector test? It's just, <laughs> just amazing. Oh, it is infuriating. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I had one follow-up question if you have time. Sure. Um, I kind of like to turn it on its head. Um, from going from ancient history to um, what you would see in the future, based on what we've seen on how, um, oh, I guess, cyclic, religions in general are. It seems like they come and go, come and go, you know, over and over and over. Uh, do you see that there will literally come a day when Christianity is phased out as most religions have been? I, uh, I suspect that's not unlikely, but it's hard for me to envision. Um, well, let, let me say that it's hard for me to envision what circumstances would lead to that and then the domination of another religion, except that if uh, we uh, in the West just lower our guard and think it is bigotry to defend our culture and traditions, uh, and we uh, pretty much let uh, militant, fanatical versions of Islam do what they're trying to do, and they're explicitly committed to... Uh, putting the West and the United States and Europe under Sharia law, 
Uh, it's possible that if the camel's nose gets under the tent, the camel will occupy the tent and we'll be outside of it freezing our butts off. That could happen if the West doesn't wake up and fear so-called Islamophobia. That is the only way I can see it happening. But I do think that uh, in the long run, we may wind up with a secularized world uh, as as uh, the world gets more pluralistic, you go down the street to the convenience store and it's run by Hindus with pictures of Hindu gods by the cash register. I, I remember seeing that. I get a huge kick out of that. Uh, if there are uh, Sikhs and, every, and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists all over the place and uh, people begin to intermarry, that's certainly happening, that will cause religious believers to push their religious identity into the back seat much as they do their ethnic identity in a pluralistic country you think of yourself as as a Briton, an american uh, whatever first and oh yeah i'm happy to have come from this and that uh, uh, country but i'm an american you're gonna or whatever you're gonna see the same thing eventually with oh yes i i come from the buddhist or the jewish heritage or whatever but but uh, it's it's almost not that important it's not in the forefront it can't be or you will have trouble in your marriage to someone who came from a different background the more that happens uh, the more vestigial religious allegiances will be and it will eventually not really matter if you say you believe it or not also religion becomes increasingly privatized in modern societies it's a sort of a pocket belief like almost like whether you believe in space aliens or not it's just a private opinion you don't really live your life by it uh, also uh, the more these countries like in the middle east become modernized uh, the less they're going to stick to a, a literal islam and that is why we have trouble with jihadists today it's what uh, Anthony Wallace called a revitalization movement. They see the populace slipping away because they like Western culture and they learn about reason and Western science and stop believing in Islam. That freaks these people out. So they, they make a last-ditch effort to uh, preserve the old way of life. And such an effort is always doomed before it starts. The, the horse has already escaped the barn, and it's not coming back. But uh, revitalization movements can, can cause a lot of damage, and, th and this one is doing that. But I think it's, it's like the beast in Revelation, or like, the, like Satan. He's thrown out of heaven to the earth, and he's, he's full of rage because he knows his time is short. So I think that's what we're dealing with, with militant Islam, and eventually it's just not going to work. And uh, the world will uh, finally become essentially secular and pluralistic. I don't know how long it'll take, but it's uh, not much beyond the foreseeable future. That's kind of what I that's, think will happen. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. In fact, it, it kind of, if you don't mind, it, it kind of raised another question on my um, when you were saying that if potentially Islam, especially the radical Islam, were to, you know, get their nose under the tent and push us out, um, like what happened with Al Ghazali back in the day when, you know, Baghdad used to be the, the cult cultural center of the world, and after he took over and banned mathematics, banned science, how much that has backslid for literally the last two millennia? Um, do you think we could ever get to the point if? And when is a country that's that um, well, devoted to that religion or any religion that we could see a reoccurrence of that? You mean uh, of the uh, kind of enlightenment they once had in the, the uh, I think it was the Abbasid Caliphate in Syria, this golden age, getting back to that with Muslims or have the retrenchment again? Exactly. After the retrenchment, with what you were saying with the, um, the, revital the revitalization movements that is trying to come on and how once the one of the first things that I see that that happens is is once the revitalists come in they want to suppress as much um, science mathematics logic reason as they possibly can and you know back in I believe it was 800 BC it literally and to me has set back the um, oh the Middle East to this day they're still yeah, oh yeah that's, yeah so do you, do you if if there was a movement big enough and they could get in, could you see that 
taken us back to maybe not that time, but let's say the, the early 20s, early 50s, to where you know we're definitely more uh, based you know, on on uh, Islamic uh, law, Sharia almost. Um, do you, you think uh, that's yes. ever because? I'm sorry. Go ahead now. I I can see that it's a. Uh, uh, it's it's it will be ironic because all revitalization movements try to beat the people they're against at their own game by adopting their technology but but coupling it with the traditional beliefs and mores as much as they can just like ayatollah khomeini when he gained power he was against the west but he communicated with his uh, followers by circulating audio tapes well, why isn't that just as satanic as other technology? He didn't mind using modern weaponry once he came into power. And it's, uh, well, even like the TV evangelists, they reject uh, modern science when it comes to biology, but they sure like broadcasting technology. So uh, I can easily imagine uh, a, a, an Islamic regime that would uh, have advanced weaponry and, and so on, but has barbaric uh, desert Bedouin beliefs, and uh, I can, I, it's not too hard to imagine a process of Finlandization that uh, we have this politically correct mania of thinking that if you're against the stated views of Islamo-fascists, you know, or if you think there are Islamo-fascists, you are an Islamophobe. I've been accused of that. And, uh, I mean, I uh, am fascinated with Islam, and I've read the Quran four times in different translations. I've studied Islam for years and years. Uh, I just uh, think that uh, Islamo-fascism is very dangerous. Just as you don't judge Christianity by the Ku Klux Klan or the Ar Aryan Nations Church. Uh, you have to draw distinctions, but they're politically correct types to think they don't. And to criticize any Muslims is to criticize Islam and all Muslims are an obvious error and it's foolish. And with that kind of hypersensitivity, it's easy to imagine people saying, well, for instance, there was a feminist that said, in solidarity with our Muslim sisters, we ought to start wearing headscarves, we American women. What? Uh, there was an Episcopal priest that said, you know, we Christians ought to start referring to God as Allah. Uh, wh what are you saying? I mean, it's, it shows that there is this better than dead kind of idea that we should be nice and accommodate the people that want to take us over. Well, it, it seems inconceivable they could take over by conventional means, but if you have such a failure of nerve, uh, you're you're welcoming them in. It's not impossible that they that that we could get this idea. You know, they ban uh, Halloween in schools because some kids can't afford it, uh, or Jehovah's Witnesses kids can't celebrate it, uh, and so nobody gets to. Well, you can easily see that insanity allowing Islamists to gain a foothold, and we would in effect be living by Sharia law. And that, that's going some, but it's not impossible to imagine. However, as a get to that point, you would have huge violence. There are loads of Americans who are not as stupid as their rulers, and there would be uh, tragic violence to remove it. So uh, even though the battle is ultimately lost, the revitalization movement ultimately cannot attain its goals because it's too late, you can have an awful lot of trouble in the meantime. And I'm afraid we will. Yeah, great point, and I think that's I think that's at least my part one of the main reasons that I try and do what I do because I am worried about the backslide, so to speak. So, thanks. And what we need, you know, where's Charles Martel when we need him? Because uh, uh, it's uh, oh boy, we have such misguided people with the hell. I used to say to my daughters when they were little girls, you know. Victoria, Veronica, if you come to get the idea that the world is run by adults who are idiots and have no idea what they're doing, you're exactly right. That's the way it is. And I think uh, you just have indicated uh, what I said yeah. pretty well. They're all lost hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, are you finished, Nagish? Is that your last question? Yeah, that's all I have. Thanks, guys. All right, cool. We've got another chat room question, and it's from Orwell again. 
uh, does Jesus actually support the fa the first five books of the Old Testament? I think he's referring to the old laws. This uh, is yeah, this is interesting. It's another one of those cases where it's really up for grabs what Jesus may have thought if there was a historical Jesus, because we have him in the Gospel of John taking a, a, a virtually Marcionite view of these are the people who believe that the Old Testament was okay for Jews, but it was not to be a Christian scripture, because Jesus' father, who we revealed, was not a Hebrew God. So they said, no Old Testament for us, we'll just start a new one. Well, Jesus is depicted in John as, as referring to uh, his father as the one whom you Jews call your God. And he speaks of your law. And uh, you get the impression here that there is no great love for, uh, for the Old Testament scripture. He quotes it in a kind of uh, word, a circumstantial ad hominem way. He says, look, uh, if, if he called them God, to whom the word of God came and the scripture can't be broken, well, then you would have to infer this. It's not like he thinks it's infallible, but he's trapped them in, in a contradiction. Now, in, uh, in Matthew, you have the opposite end of the spectrum where he says right at the outset of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it says, don't think that I've come to abrogate the law of prophets. Uh, oh, no, I've come to fulfill them. It would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for a lousy punctuation mark in the Torah to pass away. So if anybody keeps the least of these commandments, he'll be called the greatest of the kingdom of God. But anybody that relaxes other, the commandments and teaches others to do so, well, he'll get in by the skin of his teeth of it all. What is going on there? He's obviously being made like a ventriloquist dummy to reply to people like Paul, who say that Christ came to dispense with the Torah. And I say, I know, that's how he says that, don't believe it. And so uh, he, Jesus in Matthew says, you must keep every last commandment. But if you look at Matthew, and especially Mark, you get the idea that though Jesus didn't overthrow the law, he had much more lenient interpretations at several points than the scribes did. Granted, we've got to keep the Sabbath, but are you sure the poor gleaning grain on the Sabbath would uh, be a transgression? Are you sure healing the sick would be a transgression of the Sabbath? So that's a kind of reinterpretation, as many Jews did at the time. So what was he, like a, a stalwart for literal observance of the Torah, or uh, someone who said, yes, we ought to observe it and reinterpret it, or somebody who said, oh, it's not even the law of the God I represent. You've got know, Jesus used as a ventriloquist dummy by different factions of the early church, so who knows what he may have thought. Uh, was a sort of question that leans into that. Um, I think we heard last year kind of William Lane Craig's kind of apologetics for the genocide, so I was just wanting to know your opinion on that. Oh, my God. <laughs> this, yeah, he said, you know, the real victim here is those, those Israelite soldiers who said, see, I, I hate to kill this baby, but I, God says I got to do it. It's like, don't you see what you're saying, Craig? Uh, why? You're saying that the, uh, these people who committed genocidal butchery uh, were more moral than the God who commanded it, and you're okay with his orders. But like, how could they possibly have deserved it? And uh, it's, it's, of course, it's a moot point in one sense, since none of that ever happened. Uh, there is simply no archaeological evidence for Israelite conquest. Is this, I like to say, it's as if you had the old war veterans gathering in the bar and saying, here's what we should have done to those damn Canaanites. And none of it ever happened, but still, Craig thinks it did, and he's defending these, these genocidal maniacs, and presumably uh, that's just what uh, some fanatical Islamofascist would say, today. yeah, it's a shame to blow up that school bus, but Allah said we have to do it. Do you really want to make Christianity look like the Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan? Anybody that says this, I think you can just stop taking them seriously. It's shocking, unbelievable to say this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now, what I, I mean, with with that line of arguments, wouldn't you? What surprises me is that the brothers involved in the war, and I, I don't know if I've ever even heard um, Craig try to get around Yusuf for us. Um, what are you seeing when when people try and do that? Well, as I understand it, in, in the youth of Rose, Socrates, it's so great. Uh, he's been inc- accused of a capital crime of impiety by introducing other gods, and so he waits around the the Hall of Justice until youth of Rose gets there. He says, oh, just a man I wanted to see. Now, I've been arrested for impiety. I'm not even sure I understand the charge, but uh, as I understand it, youth of Rose, you have indicted your own father uh, for impiety, so you must know what it is. Can you tell me? It's well, sure, Socrates. It's uh, impiety is doing that which uh, displeases the gods. Okay, uh, but gee, you know, the union tells us that certain things displease some gods but please others. What do you do there? Oh, well, I guess it's anything that all the gods would agree is displeasing. Oh, okay, but tell, tell me this. Uh, uh, do they disapprove of certain things because they know they are evil, or do we just call them evil because the gods happen not to like them? And you throw response is, gee, look at your time, i got to run. And uh, so what is, what is the ultimate? If, if God has to be moral, then morality is more ultimate than God. Uh, well, you sort of don't want that. That's like Zeus being subject to fate. Uh, you want God to be the ultimate reality. But if he is, and he simply dictates, eh, I think I'll say uh, murder is wrong today. I mean, next week, who knows? Uh, if, if it's by a whim, then ethics is reduced to, uh, to, to just nonsense, and you can have genocide. There's nothing God can't be imagined as commanding. How about thou shalt rape today? Uh, and, and so nobody wants that so-called divine voluntarist view. So uh, what do they do? Well, they say, well, you see, there isn't really a problem because God's nature is the same thing as good. Now, I'm sorry. Uh, you are predicating something of God that is not contained in the definition of the term. So you're saying it is an outside reference by which we characterize God. Yes, he conforms to what we mean by good. You just can't escape that way. And so which is it going to be? Is God inferior to morality, in which case we don't really need God. We can figure out morality anyhow. Or is, uh, is morality subject to a divine whim, which is very dangerous since nobody hears directly from God except lunatics. We just uh, take a book or the interpreters of, a, of an institution and claim to know how to read the thing. We have to take their word for it. It just finally fails. And look at the horror that it leads to. If he uh, comes to this point, you got to say, look, pal, you have made a wrong turn somewhere. You're making God into the devil. And you will become devilish if this is your uh, paradigm for righteousness. That's why Christians must reject the belief in hell. If a God who is loving is compatible with eternally tormenting people, look what that does to your moral ideal. It, it says cruelty is compatible, sadism is compatible, so I might as well do it. No, no, do not make, believe in God if you want, but don't make God into the devil. Yeah, that, that's great. And the only thing that I've heard, and I guess, that they, they tend to try to split one of the horns by saying that, well, it's, it's part of God's nature. And it's the same dodge. Exactly. It, it re- it's it, part of God's nature. Uh, you're, you're applying an extrinsic definition to God, because if you were simply saying good, it's determined by the divine nature, whatever it is. You're back to uh, divine voluntarism. Whatever God says goes, just as God says it. It just doesn't work, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, have you heard Craig's opinion on that? Because that's what I was saying. Is I don't know if I've heard him speak to that directly. Uh, I don't know. I, I rather think he has embraced divine voluntarism, but I don't know if he if he. Uh, does the retreat to, uh, well, it's the nature of God to be good. He probably thinks he has escaped it, but uh, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, that seems to me just to be taking refuge in, in a contradiction, which means you have no real view. There's no view there to explain. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's all I had, guys. This guy, keep in mind, is a creationist. I mean, that is such a, a bankrupt view that it's hard to take anything else he says seriously once you know that. You mean you don't believe in evolution, not even theistic evolution? Something is drastically wrong. This guy is, uh, it's not that he's not playing with a full deck, but the only card to use is in the Jokers. <laughs> Well, I, I think you kind of hit it on the uh, head earlier when you said that he's not as ignorant as he seems. I think that there is a big part of him that is is literally just dishonest, and we use anything he can to further his cause. Uh, it appears to me to be like a political spin doctor, uh, and uh, then nothing more than that, uh, or like a, an oily defense attorney, you know, someone who would defend O.J. Simpson or, or someone like that. Oh, that's what people hated about the sophists in Socrates' day. And these guys will pay you to argue any side of the case and win. Well, that's what he's doing. He's the, the hired gun for whatever it is, uh, Campus Crusade or whatever that fundamentalist school is. He's just a pitch man. There's not a chance in the world that he's even open to moving on anything. And when uh, Michael Icona, who's a uh, uh, up and coming apologist, he wrote some vast, huge book on the resurrection recently. Yeah, he, he said, you know, this thing about the, uh, the, the dead returning to life in Matthew at the time of the crucifixion and then going into the city and showing themselves to people. He said, maybe that's not literally true. Maybe that's a kind of theological uh, parable about Jesus brings new life. Well, he got called on the carpet by Norman Geisler, one of the elder statesmen of the evangelical movement, and uh, he uh, immediately came back with his tail between his legs and said, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. I'll change it in future editions of the book. Now, that's, that's not the really, uh, consistent view. The poor bastard. Uh, it, it's so tragic. He's made to recant if he wants to keep any place in the, uh, in the evangelical subculture. And I doubt that he even can anymore. But you, can you imagine that compatible with any sort of academic freedom? Uh, and this poor guy made one little step toward a reasonable view of, of the New Testament, and he's canned for it. Uh, you want to get converted and, and move into that kind of a, a subculture? Not me. Yep, absolutely. And guys, I think I'm I've way gone over uh, y'all's uh, <laughs> time, and I really appreciate everything you've let me. So I think I'm going to go ahead and bow out and let somebody else get in here. So thanks again. No problem. Thanks for the call. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, there was a, a question by Warrior Christian. He asks uh, about hell. Uh, I, I assume what he means is uh, what um, what does the Bible actually say? Well, it's the, the record of a growing belief. Uh, there, you have two options in the Old Testament, as in the Garden of Eden a story and Psalm 90, which I think is kind of a commentary on it. You have the notion that the dead simply die. Uh, and Job also, though different parts of it contradict, like when he asks the rhetorical question, uh, if one dies, can he live again? Obviously not, is the implication. So there's just death. I mean, you came from dust, you will return to dust. But side by side with it, there is a common Mediterranean Near Eastern view of Sheol, as it's called, uh, the pit or the covered place. Uh, where uh, they, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, and the ancient Hebrews believed that there was a nether world of shadow and dust. Uh, the Gilgamesh epic speaks of it as a great walled city, and once you go in, you can never exit. And people drift about in a kind of confused state, and uh, it's, it's not active torment, and it's no fun, a kind of a parking garage for, for souls. And uh, everybody went there. Jacob says, well, I'm mourning the loss of my son, but I'll see him again in Sheol when we meet up and so forth. Well, then uh, they eventually, 
adopted the notion of Tartarus or Hades, a uh, fiery place of, of torment, this ultimately came from the from Neo-Pythagorean philosophers from Sicily. Sicily has this landscape where it's, there are volcanoes, funerals, uh, boiling jets of water coming up out of the earth, and uh, the uh, it, it seems pretty clear that they brought this idea that the, these are hell mouths and there must be a fiery pit of torment underneath there. They brought this long ago into the Near East, and so there was at least a, a belief that at the foot of Mount Zion there was this fiery kingdom of the god Molech to whom the Bible says infants were sacrificed in fire and they believed he would devour them and he was devouring them as you burn the poor types. And uh, a practice that's pretty much returned in the recurrence of infanticide in our decadent society. Uh, they just they had a ritual for it. Well, they believed that this place called Tophet uh, in the valley outside of Jerusalem, and that was the um, opening to it. Now, they didn't necessarily believe people were in conscious torment inside, but it was a kind of fiery netherworld. Well, time goes on, and we start reading that the fallen angels are imprisoned in Tartarus, uh, just like in uh, Hesiod's Theogony, when the, the Titans were, were imprisoned there. And uh, it, in the New Testament, we start hearing about, well, actually, in the late states of the Old Testament, we hear about the righteous being resurrected from the dead. But by the time of the New Testament, there is there is also the idea that the wicked will be raised from the dead, uh, yanked out of an intermediate uh, holding cell of torments, and thrown uh, into the lake of burning sulfur, as in the book of Revelation in Matthew 25. And... Uh, whether there is conscious torment there is not absolutely clear. It may be as Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses say that you just annihilate it, which gives you know, the alternative ain't bad. Uh, the book of Revelation says that those who have taken the mark of the beast who have knuckled under the Antichrist, they will be cast into a lake of fire uh, whose smoke goes up before the throne of God and the Lamb forever and ever, the smoke of their torment, it says. So one place in the Bible does specify eternal conscious torment, but only for a special group of people at the end of the age. There's no other place, even when they mention fire, that, that says people will be consciously tormented there. Matthew has several passages where he has added to his sources uh, Mark and Q um, lines about how people will be uh, cast into the fiery furnace or the outer darkness, etc., where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he may well have believed in an eternal period of torment, but it's not absolutely clear. So I think we do find uh, the modern idea of an eternal tormenting, uh, fiery place in the Bible, though just barely. And certainly the Old Testament writers didn't have such a notion. Yeah. So what are you going to believe? I mean, you, you can trace like a progression of fossils the development of this view. It, it, it's kind of a nasty trick. If God knew this was a lady, he would, didn't tell them for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so uh, I think there is evidence, but the nature of the evidence as a gradual build-up tends to discredit the notion that this is some sort of revealed truth. Okay, um, to follow up on that, uh, this idea that non-believers go to hell, then, that, that's, that's not actually in the Bible, then. Well, the hell part is not necessarily in there, because it's, it's impossible to say what the writers who do teach exclusivity think the alternative is. Uh, for instance, in the Gospel of John, uh, the famous passage of John 14:6, um, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that certainly seems to indicate uh, you've got to be, well, let, let's say this, no one can be saved without the atonement of Christ. But of course you could argue, well, everyone is saved because Christ died for the human race and it worked. 
I didn't just make it possible for you to be saved. He saved you. And so I thought that. But it's not reasonable to say what he means is you must believe I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But he doesn't say it. Uh, you yeah. get closer. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think you m misunderstood my question then. Oh, okay. um, uh, what I mean is, uh, you mentioned that there there was mention of uh, eternal torment, but only for specific groups of people. That's so, right. Yeah. So, so with the idea that uh, okay, if you believe you're saved, okay, great, and if you're one of those, uh, you know, the the wicked, then you're going to be tortured forever. Okay, what if you're not wicked, but you just didn't believe? Are you in that that group that gets to be tortured forever anyway, or hmm. is this just not addressed? I think it is, once again, barely addressed, though it's there. You just don't find it all over the place. When the, I think Peter's preaching in the, the early chapters of Acts, he says, uh, for there's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus, well, when he's put in terms of a name, that implies like a baptismal confession. You've got to call on the name of Jesus to be saved. Now, what does he think is going to happen to those who don't? Uh, it could be that they're just going to stay dead. It could be that they're going to rise from the dead and face the music. But what will happen then, he, he doesn't say. Uh, in First Corinthians 15, it speaks of the Christians rising from the dead, but it implies everybody else whether they're positively wicked or just belong to another faith, uh, just staying dead, uh, no real punishment. Uh, and isn't even that narrow that you're, you're saying? It really matters the religious tag you have. I mean, you got to have faith in Christ, but if you're not righteous, you're not in. But uh, even if you are righteous but don't have faith in Christ, I'm sorry, uh, and, and, of course, people will turn that around and say, well, non-Christians aren't really righteous. They may do a good uh, imitation of it, but that's even more vicious uh, to, to just uh, say, well, you must be hiding something. Uh, but uh, the notion that, uh, like, what I've asked Paul a little at Wheaton College is, well, how would God be uh, saved? Because he, you know, had a lot of respect for Jesus, but he was Hindu, and Little said, well, yes, uh, if he accepted Christ as his personal Savior before he died, well, in other words, you think he's in hell. Uh, and uh, that's just spin again. But uh, it's hard to say whether they believed you would be damned just for not being a Christian, because you could be a Christian and still be damned in, in the New Testament. Uh, so it's it's there. Like First John is a classic sectarian document. Those outside, you know, they're, they're filled with hate. They're no good. But here in the, the, the Church of Christ, uh, we we love one another and we're okay. You just automatically equate non-believers with sinners. It's just classic sectarian. Uh, yeah. uh, what do you call it? Uh, galvanizing. Uh, like uh, what, bifurcation. Oh, well, yeah. it's us and everybody else. You do see that. It's, it seems to assume you've got to be Christian. And yet there are these hints that Jews are shut out of the gospel now, the, the Gentiles are crack at it, and one day we'll all be together again. Or they assume the Old Testament patriarchs are in heaven. They certainly knew nothing about the cross. So there are these strange hints uh, that uh, maybe it's not that open and shut. But that's all you're dealing with, fragments and hints. It's a lawful, slim basis to erect a huge dogma on. Okay, I think uh, we're uh, running out of time here. There's some... Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I sure enjoy it. Well, I have a new paperback uh, that's, uh, I guess it's available on my website, robertmprice.mindbender.com. Mindbender is spelled M-I-N-D-V-E-N-D-O-R, robertmprice.mindbender.com. Uh, and uh, it's a, a rejoinder to the screw tape letters of C.S. Lewis. It's called The Needle Toe Letters. And uh, I think... Some folks might enjoy that. 
I have a new book on Paul coming out in January called Signature Books, and it'll be on Amazon. In fact, I think you can pre-order now called The Amazing Colossal Apostle. And shortly, I'm not sure from whom, there will be this book evolving out of Eden, Christian Responses to Evolution. So those are some of the new things. Also, I, I'm, I have a sort of high, just to my jackal side, I have a new horror fiction anthology coming out. Uh, I guess it's out now, uh, called Worlds of Cthulhu from Fidelga and Brimmer um, Press. And I'm sure that's on Amazon also. I'm the exclusive editor of that. So I have a friend of to the book. Uh, I do that about three or four times a week, and they post it on there. I'm not quite sure. I guess if you just Google Bible, you can connect you with it. Uh, just the middle of the other day, twice a month, I do a similar thing called the Human Bible for the Center for Inquiry. I just did one of those the other day, so that ought to be up pretty soon. No problem. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, as always. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank you guys. Thanks, Zulu, and uh, you guys, Marty and uh, Michael. Thank you guys for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. I had a really good time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robert Price, for your time. Uh, um, very intellectual person, and I love your work. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. In two hours, guys, uh, on the Skeptic Fence Show channel, we have a debate going on between Jason Burns, uh, Zwemer 100, you guys might know him by, and Negation of P. Uh, that starts in two hours. I'll post two links here. And uh, DPR Jones will be the moderator of this debate, and it's going to be a two-hour debate. Uh, it's going to be a theist versus atheist. So um, I'll post the videos, and you guys can check it out, what, it, what the debate's going to be, be about. Thanks. Uh, the debate topic will be, uh, let me see here, it's basically going to be, what will we be debating it? is the questions I raise in this YouTube video, testing for faith in God, proof you do not believe. So that's basically what's going to be going over. No, no problem, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot.